You may remain seated for the invocation. God our Father, thou art the source of our human existence, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Thou art the end and goal toward which we move. Thou art the companion in whose light and love we seek the way to live with ourselves and with one another. Help us, we pray, to be what we might be. Save us from too easy satisfactions with what we are. Help us to see our lives in the context of values and meanings which most nearly reflect thy purposes. For the sake of Christ our Lord. Amen. We greet again those not assembled here with us, but listening in on these lectures on the campuses of the Central States College Association, spread out over five states, and receiving these lectures by telephonic communication. I remind you also that you may address your questions to the lecturer by use of the question cards which you have received. That which has been distinctive about this particular science symposium has been that it has lifted up what we've called a science-based issue and subjected it to the scrutiny of other disciplines, not necessarily critically, but helpfully. It might be argued that these Nobel conferences are nonetheless somewhat weighted on the side of the science representatives, but if so, it reflects the complexity and diversity of, of the scientific aspects of any issue, particularly in today's explosive world. Dr. Houston Smith last night addressed himself to considerations which are particularly germane to man as a thinking being as compared to somewhat comparable processes that man may create or produce through mechanical models. Dr. James Gustafson reflects the specifically religious concerns and brings to the discussion of the subject the concepts and considerations which come out of the Christian understanding of man. He is not only an authentic interpreter of the tradition which has characterized the believing community, but also an incisive and provocative analyst of contemporary attitudes and outlooks and of the issues to which they are directed. Dr. Gustafson is professor of social ethics at Yale University's Divinity School and chairman of the Department of Religious Studies at Yale University. In the, in the latter role, he has extensive responsibility for graduate studies in the field of religion. I'm pleased to present Dr. James Gustafson, who will speak on the subject, Christian Humanism and the Human Mind. Dr. Gustafson. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, and my distinguished colleagues on this, in this symposium, it is uh, a rather frightening as well as worthwhile thing to try to engage in some meaningful discussion with scientists dealing with matters as complex as my colleagues on this symposium are, simply to engage them in discussion pertaining to the co problems that are common to us all. I have modest hopes that perhaps we can begin and continue a process of conversation here today. We are evolution. So wrote the French Jesuit Pierre Teilhard de Jardin. Making the point more poignantly, he said, we have become aware that in the great game that is being played, we are the players as well as being the cards and the stakes. Christopher Mooney, in a faithful exposition of this passage from Teilhard says, for it is not only in man that the movement of evolution is now carried on, but by man. Through man, evolution has not only become conscious of itself, but free to dispose of itself. It can give itself or refuse itself. 
Upon man, therefore, falls the awful responsibility of his future on Earth. Evolution can be carried on in man by man. The topic of this Nobel conference, like those of the previous two, faces this awesome point. What was formerly shrouded in mystery, interpreted by myths, assumed to be under the determinative powers of providence or fate, or the effects of random chance, is becoming known and manageable through the research of molecular biologists. With more accurate and intricate explanations of the electrochemical system of the brain comes a heightened sense of man's freedom and power to control the minds of men. This new knowledge does not in itself determine the use that will be made of it, any more than the knowledge of nuclear physics in itself determines the uses made of it. But the growing recognition of its potential uses intensifies our senses of responsibility and obligation. The sense of responsibility and obligation, however, is not in itself determinative of the answers to the questions responsible to whom, obligated to whom, responsible for what, obligated for what. This new knowledge intensifies our awareness of human freedom in the sense that we are not as enslaved to ignorance as we have been, and in the sense that we realize that men can now direct the course of human development rather than be the more passive reactors to processes over which they have had little control. Men need not be the accidental effects of generations of genetic development. Their knowledge of genetics moves them toward liberation from domination by random development to the liberty and to the power to direct future development. Men need no longer simply adapt to their natural environments, but can culturally and technically achieve the liberty to control their environments to some extent, indeed to create environments adapted to man. Men need no longer assume that their brains are stable givens upon which registers the impressions to which they happen to become subject, they are beginning to perceive that the brain itself is subject to development, as we saw with some references yesterday in Professor Hudain's address, as a result of the neurobiological experiments and potential uses of them. Thus, while men have for ages assumed that they could develop their minds by training and study, they now see that they may be able to control and develop their brains in such a way that their minds are capable of new responses and new achievements. It is this kind of knowledge and with its accompanying sense both of liberation and responsibility, both power and obligation, that Teilhard de Chardin had in mind when he made that statement so clear that any card player can understand it. We have become aware that in the great game that is being played, we are the players as well as being the cards and the stakes. The cards are more complicated Molecular biology gives us an increasingly complex deck that requires elite capacities and training to understand fully. The stakes are probably higher, the future of man itself, but the players are in many respects the same. Morally, there has been no progress to compare with scientific and technical progress among the players, whether they be theologians or scientists, humanists or technologists, politicians or investors, business managers or philosophers. I would like to make some simple observations about this situation and about some of the responses that have been made to it before proceeding to suggest some concerns and some lines of activity that I believe it might be fruitful for us to consider. My first observation is this. The values of human life have not appeared more clearly because we have a more accurate account of the facts of human life. Neurobiologists move toward giving us more and more accurate accounts of memory, but these accounts in themselves do not tell us what is worth remembering and what is worth forgetting. It is worth remembering the things that I have learned in reading about the research of molecular biologists. 
and it is worth remembering what I learn in this conference. But it is not worth remembering what I had for breakfast this morning or what the name of the stewardess was on the flight that took me to Minnesota. One of the ironic things about memory, I suppose, is that I will always remember what I had for breakfast this morning because I here noted that it wasn't worth remembering. <laughs> to introduce the word worth is to introduce a realm of discourse that has a considerable autonomy from the realm of scientific discourse. How would I decide what is worth remembering? This could be answered by referring to many values, and I'm not referring to values here in any kind of metaphysical sense, but in a more common sense usage of the word. This could be answered by referring to many values, not all of which are necessarily in harmony with each other, and not all of which I might consider to be praiseworthy. Let me suggest a couple of them in a random way. I might say that it's worth remembering what I read about molecular biology, so that I can make a favorable impression on people that I talk to at cocktail parties and over luncheon tables. I could impress them as being a person who ha seems to have some knowledge outside of his own field of specialization. And thus, if they value learned men, my memory of these things would redound to my glory. Appealing to the most commonly accepted standards of moral values, however, this would hardly be a very good reason for remembering this information. I might say that it is worth remembering because it will be useful to me in my future teaching and research in the field of ethics. Then the next question is, what constitutes usefulness or utility? I could answer that in various ways. My students and I would be forced to deal more concretely with specific issues that are very complex and thus, we would not be able to get away with platitudes and high-level abstractions in the way in which we have in the past. This is to appeal to the importance of something we might call realism, of facing honestly and directly certain hard questions. Or I might say that the material that su suggests the potentially most important consequences for man is more useful to remember than such trivial but useful information as where in the Sterling Memorial Library I will find the works of Aristotle and the secondary materials on them. This latter reason would appeal to the values we would affirm about the continuation and development of life itself. It is more useful to retain information about materials that will have potentially great effects on the life of the universal human community. This, most men would agree, would be a better reason for remembering than would a desire to impress people with one's own erudition. Why? Because life is valued, and its continuity and development is thus worthy of more attention than any one man's vanity. But in each instance, I appeal to a value that does not immediately emerge from the biological facts themselves. My second observation is that this gap between facts about life and the values of life moves towards some closure if certain assumptions are made. These assumptions might be stated as follows. First, to know is itself of value. Now why would this be? Because man has developed into the kind of being that has insatiable curiosity about himself and the world around him. And thus, in fulfillment of this drive for knowledge, there is a fulfillment development and extension of man's existence itself. This assumption presupposes that it is good simply to be, and that to be human is in part to be curious about life, and that this curiosity is good. But it does not yet face the question of uses of knowledge. Second, in penetrating the molecular biology of the brain, we discern with reference to other animals and with reference to some aspects of man's own past, a direction of development. And that this direction is on the whole worthy of sustaining and promoting. The latter phrase jars us a little, it seems to me, because there is a kind of leap of faith that is involved in it. A Teilhard de Chardin makes the leap in a double move. 
He extrapolates from where he ascertains the evolutionary process has come to where he thinks on the basis of speculative reason it is going with its hominization, personalization, and other things moving toward an omega point. At the same time that this extrapolation is being made, he is impregnating it with certain ideas derived from Christian faith about a, quote, Christification of the process, its amorization, impregnation of love into it, because God has entered history and nature in the person of Jesus Christ. But Tyard's double move is questionable, and he himself certainly is not a blind optimist about life, as our introductory quotation suggests. We can ask, with reference to his moves on factual grounds, how much extrapolation is warranted on the basis of evidence from the past. With man's new liberty and power to give direction to evolution, can we assume continuities based on projections from the most primitive forms of life? Or do we have to face the possibility of more radical discontinuities in human development? If we have to be faced with the possibility of more radical discontinuities as a result of man's new power to interpose in developments, then we ought to be more modest in our projections. We could ask on theological grounds whether affirmations about the redemption of life by a gracious deed of God properly pertain to an impregnation of a natural evolutionary process. The molecular biologists I have read and tried to understand are not theologians, but they are moral men. The second move of Tyard's would not be persuasive, the Christification of the evolutionary process. But the first could at least be discussed. Is there a discernible direction over the long history of man's existence in the development of the brain? That is, to a considerable extent, a factual matter, subject to verification. Is that direction good? The answer to that question suggests that the convergence of fact and value begins to diverge again. How it would be answered would involve, at crucial points, leaps of faith on the part of biologists. It would involve, at some point, a move beyond empirical and rational support to an affirmation that A, the continuation of life is of value, and B, that the development of life in the direction in which it is moving and could move is of value. It is the latter that is a little bit jarring, and the uncertainties about it locate the moral questions we all now face together. My third observation is of a different order and pertains perhaps more to people who are interested in contemporary uh, religious discourse. It pertains to religious and theological responses that have been made, not to anything as particular as the work of the neurobiologists, but to the awareness of man's new freedom and power to give direction to human development. This awareness has, to a considerable extent, been embraced as a cultural fact of great theological significance, or at least of one that has implications for theology and for religious life. Among the popular notions in contemporary religious discourse, indeed notions that are overused and imprecisely developed, are those of man having achieved, quote, maturity in a world come of age. If maturity is used analogously to its use as a chronological and biological term, with reference to growth processes from infancy to childhood to adolescence to adulthood, it will be as misleading as other biological analogies have been for the interpretation of historical developments. Do we move on in to old age and death? No one knows. If maturity is used analogously to a psychological process, suggesting that in infancy there is almost absolute dependence on support from others, and that one gradually grows to greater autonomy, there might be some warrant for its use with reference to men in our present age. Man has some greater autonomy with reference to nature through his knowledge and his power, though he is still obviously dependent on many things. If maturity suggests a growth in moral wisdom, a fulfillment of potential qualities for excellence, 
so that religious men now heartily and indiscriminately embrace scientific and technological developments in the culture as worthy of unmitigated joyful celebration, its use is dubious indeed. I believe that the popular avant-garde religious discourse has made some mistakes in its broadside and indiscriminate celebration of the new age in which we are supposed to be living, mistakes that morally conscientious scientists themselves are not making. These mistakes are several. If what is celebrated is liberation from determination by nature and ideas about nature that have in some sense crippled man spiritually and intellectually, there is some propriety to the mood of celebration. If, however, in the celebration it is assumed that this new liberty and power are somehow or another going to be directed by a moral wisdom to the well-being of man, the joy and the praise is still premature. If the celebration assumes that now religious men can see that the world is good and that it is for man in some simple way, whereas formerly religious men felt that the world had to be denied, they have grounds for celebrating a recovered theological belief, that is, that God the creator of the world is graciously good and is together with his creation good for man. But there are no grounds for confusing this theological affirmation with the facts of historical and scientific development. What religious men believe about God, his goodness, the goodness of his creation, the omega towards which it is moving, can rightfully tell them something about what they ought to intend that scientific developments be used for. It may tell them something about their attitude toward scientific developments, or that this ought to be opened rather than closed. But there is no warrant for assuming that the new power and the new freedom are being or will be used unambiguously for human good, or for the good even of biological development. The possibilities of new freedom and new power do not either by natural endowment or by some special grace of God bring with them a quality of moral maturity. The hard issues are not even addressed by the celebration of science and technology. Celebration is an expression of an attitude, in this case an affirmative one. It does not help either the molecular biologist or the technician solve the problems of the ends to which knowledge and power ought to be put, the values to be served, the means of both control and development to be instituted in the uses of knowledge. If the celebrative theme is to say something to biologists, I cannot imagine what it is. I doubt if they care one whit whether Christians have now decided to embrace what some of them, that is, what some Christians have formerly feared. I suspect that they might appreciate more understanding and hard work on the parts of people primarily concerned with the ends of human existence as these ends pertain to the wider range of choices that their research now presents to men. My fourth observation pertains to the impact on theological thinking and religious life of our awareness that we are the players as well as the cards and the stakes. Both man's thinking about the nature of ultimate being and his disposition in life are being altered by the awareness that we are participants in creativity rather than the tenders and caretakers of something that has been created. We are shapers rather than conformers to static established shapes. The move of thinking about things as static to thinking about them as dynamic has been in the making for many decades. There have been philosophical contributions, there have been theological contributions. Recently in Catholic thought as well, the notion has taken hold, not only in Teilhard de Jardin, but among many others. The American Jesuit Robert Johan, in his recent Aquinas lecture on the pragmatic meaning of God, makes the point in this way. Instead of separating man from his environment, Personal transcendence as presently conceived, and by that Johan means something like Sir John's view of consciousness and something like what I am indicating by man's new freedom and power. Personal transcendence as presently conceived means a new intimacy 
and a more significant with involvement with man's environment. It marks the release of limitless possibilities and opens the door to a more truly human and genuinely creative participation of man in the world. God for Father Johann is the essential condition for this creative participation and interaction. He is the one who enables all things to come into coherence and community as they interact with each other. This is neither the time nor the place to examine critically various doctrines of God as they correlate with our new consciousness of creativity. It is proper, however, to underline a trend in theological and religious reflection, namely that man is the actor and innovator, responding and interacting with the actions of other beings, including the activity of God himself. I would be remiss if I did not recall that more biblically oriented theology has found grounds in scripture for more dynamic interpretations of the nature of God and his relations to man and the world. Joseph Settler, a master of theological aphorisms, put it this way, God simply is what God manifestly does. Gustav Wingrain, and I thought it was proper to quote at least from one Swedish theologian at Gustavus Adolphus, Gustav Wingrain, in expounding the meaning of God's law, says that, quote, God's demand that men should continue to have dominion over creation is a part of his, that is, God's continuing creation of the world. This suggests that the meaning of God the creator is to be developed in terms of a continuous creative activity of God and that man's scientific and technological pursuits are part of man's dominion over the world that man is to have, and this, these technological pursuits are themselves part of God's own creative activity in the world. H. Richard Niebuhr moves from the indicative language of God's action in the world to its consequent imperative. In his famous sentences, God is acting in all actions upon us. So respond to all actions upon us as to respond to his, that is, to God's action. From all this, it can, at a minimum, be observed that theological thought and religious interpretation of life are affirming not static models of being, although the dynamic ones have structure and order to them, but models that conceive both of God and man in active and interactive terms. This does not mean that they make man the creator, however, any more than the molecular biologist claims that he or any other man has created the neurons he examines. Rather, man is seen as the creative responder and innovator in interaction with development and activity that is already there, that is going on. But the creative interaction is not an end in itself. What the religious men have audacity to suggest is that they may have some insight into the outcome, to what the outcome of that creative interaction ought to be, the direction in which it ought to go in the course of development. The religious man has a source to which he turns for insight into values that are worthy of acceptance, sustenance, and development. I have no interest here in claiming that this source is a revelation of God or how it might even be considered a revelation of God. We have all of us, Christians and non-Christians of like, participated in a Western cultural tradition which has already embodied many of these values. Many of them have been apparently confirmed, both by reason and by experience, as worthy of appropriation, or at least consideration, in thinking about the uses that freedom and power of man ought to have, ought to be put to, what ends they ought to serve we can find in them some clues about the value and meaning of existence, man together with other men. These four observations and some commentary on them are not random in choice, but are the bases from which I shall now move to some more particular considerations about the human and moral potentialities and threats that research of molecular biologists on the brain seem to portend to this single person.
What I have said in a preceding way can, in preceding remarks can be restated as a way of moving into what I want to say. The question that the molecular biologists are proceeding to answer is this one. How does the brain function? But this is not the same question as what does it mean to be a person? But the two questions are related. They are related existentially for all of us, biologists, theologians, and humanists alike, because we are persons who have been exposed to the knowledge that the scientists have given us. Biologists are persons living in community with others. We non-biologists like them are persons whose understanding of life is altered by the knowledge that they give us. The relation between the questions, however, is not just an existential one. Whatever qualities or dimensions that we might wish to include in our understanding of what it means to be a person are biologically dependent upon our having the intricate brains that human beings have in contrast with other animals. We could not even wonder about what it means to be a person, as Sir John reminded us yesterday, what the ends and values of man's life are if we did not have memory, if we did not have the ability to reflect the cells and the fluids and the connections between all these things that biologists are now describing for us. We could not ask the question of values if we did not have the brains that have developed over long centuries of evolution from other forms of life, if there were not similarities between us and the rats on which so much research is done and about which so many of my humanistic colleagues enjoy making snide remarks. Given the brain that we are now coming to know and to understand in biological terms, the Christian humanist can raise three general areas for reflection and response. First, how are we to be disposed? What ought our attitude to be toward this knowledge and its potential use? Second, what are the functional requisites for maintaining personal life? What are the values necessary to maintain meaningful personal existence? Third, are there any directives that can be formulated that will give us some direction to the ends and means in the use of the research that we now are beginning to understand for the sake of the well-being of man? First, our disposition toward research. How are we to be disposed toward the research of molecular biologists to explore the brain and to the potential uses of this research? I wish to stress the notion of disposition here, for it has a proper reference and proper limit. It refers to our fundamental attitudes toward, in this case, the research and its use. In themselves, we have noted, with reference to the cel celebrative or celebrative attitude, attitudes do not tell us what to do. Something more is needed, namely, intellectual reflection in the determination of purposes and ends, and the will to act in accordance with the ends that we can formulate. But attitudes are important, and we sense their significance, especially in a situation to which this conference is addressed. It would not be difficult to stack the cards of knowledge and of man's potential use of knowledge so that a disposition of fear could be evoked. Indeed, the evocation of fear has often been the response of both scientists and humanists to some new developments in scientific research. We need recall only the response of many humanists and scientists to the unleashing of nuclear energy to see how fear is not only a rather natural moral disposition, but also morally a rather proper one. I recall, for example, not only the early numbers of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, but addresses that I heard by Professor, Professor Harold Urey at the University of Chicago right after the Second World War when I was a student there as efforts to awaken the moral sensitivities of other intellectuals to the potential dangers of atomic warfare. There was no ringing apocalypticism in these presentations by responsible scientists. There was, however, an appeal to dread. 
the dread of possible unintended alteration of human life, indeed the dread of its destruction. Such dread is fitting now as it was then. It is not dread of biological information, but dread of man's inability to organize and use it in such a way that certain fundamental values upon which almost all men agree, namely the values of life as we now know it and its continuation, would be sustained. The, the appeal to dread, an attitude, a disposition which is impregnated with emotion, was not an end in itself, fortunately. In cooperation with others, efforts were made to protect life, to channel the uses of nuclear research so that a measure of order has persisted, though in the eyes of many of us that order remains fragile enough to warrant continued vigilance. With reference to brain research, there has also been enough publicity to evoke dread and fear in men. Essays through the years on the work of my own university colleague, Dr. Jose Delgado and others, has persistently raised the question of who controls the electronic devices that in turn control the electrodes that can be placed in certain areas of the brain so that the behavior itself is in turn controlled. This was rather dramatically illustrated when Dr. Delgado spent a leave year in Madrid and proceeded to do the much publicized uh, uh, bullfighting incident in which the use of electrodes in the brain of the bull, he went out there simply with some little panel in his hand and managed to control the bull's behavior, uh, dramatically altering the possibilities of bullfighting, I suppose. <laughs> the dread is not so much of potential destruction as in the case of nuclear war, as it is in the possibility of the accumulation of power that could be used to determine and control the behavior of men in ways that are not possible at the present time. The latter phrase is important. There are and always have been ways in which the minds of men have been directed by teaching, by indoctrination, by propaganda, by controls of the kinds of information and ideas that men can have access to. Every such effort has been to train minds to respond in particular ways, and in ways which in themselves vary greatly, partially according to certain moral values that people have held. Perhaps the new element of dread comes in, in with the possibilities of determination of behavior through drugs and electrical stimulations. These possibilities portend the diminution of liberty of individuals without power to reject or accept the stimulation of those who have power. What is dreaded is that the new knowledge, which gives potential capacities to control the brain, will fall into the power of those whose values we may not approve of. With most knowledge that evokes new dread, there is also new hope. Whether dread or hope are evoked depends upon many things, including the sophistication of knowledge about potential uses, the availability of resources to protect against misuses, and to foster what be, would be considered good uses. We have already seen how some drugs can be used to still the potential violence of psychotics and to raise the level of achievement of depressive. How many persons whose humanity and productivity in the human community have been crippled by mental illness have been able to resume fruitful and quite normal human activities. I have not found, however, any evangelistic utopians among neurobiologists who are sounding the coming of a new age as a result of their research, a new age in which men will now achieve the absolute good or achieve some state of persistent euphoria. Even where one might find hints that there is a new sense of peace and harmony possible through these techniques, this is seen itself to raise other questions about the meaningfulness and productivity of life under such potential harmonious and euphoric conditions. What kinds of dispositions seem proper in the light of neurobiological research? And on what grounds could we deem them to be proper? The morally ambiguous possibilities of the use of knowledge is clear. One does not need a theologian to remind men of that. Though it sounds terribly like a middle way, 
A case can be made for realism without despair, for hope without illusion, for avoiding the attitudes of apocalypticism on the one hand and utopianism on the other. Some of the bases for this can be briefly adumbrated. First, the moral conscientiousness of researchers themselves gives considerable ground for confidence. While their scientific work proceeds without immediate justification by social and humane values that are the more professional concerns of some of the rest of us, they are themselves men who love life, who defend the conditions in life which enable them to exercise their intelligence and their freedom and envision the potential possibilities for and threats to human order and life that might be forthcoming from their work. They existentially unite the humane and the scientific and often are more aware of the relations of one to the other than are many people who simply embody the humane. Second, in free societies there is a social pluralism that gives ground for confidence that enables us to be realistic and hopeful at once. Social pluralism in free societies, while it creates tensions and abrasiveness that make human relationships terribly complex, keeps alive also a diversity of values since various communities in the society tend to the cultivation of different interests and values. It also keeps alive a diversity of institutionalized centers of power that prohibit any one center of power from absolutely dominating. The normative moral concerns of religious communities, for example, are never simply embodied by universities or business establishments or the state, simply for other reasons, because religious bodies don't have the power to determine other institutions. But there is always abrasion between the interests and values of religious and other groups. But there are also common centers of loyalty and commitment that all men share in common, which enable them to live not only in some peace, but in some creative interaction with each other. In this interaction with each other, it is possible for each to learn from the other, each to restrain and to limit the other, each to make its contribution to the general direction that the society itself takes. Very often the fear that one interest or value community in the society creates in the minds of members of another is simply the result of absence of interaction and communication between them. It is my judgment that we can be realistic and hopeful about the uses of the knowledge that we are now getting about the way the brain works as long as we have plurality of interest and value communities and social institutions in significant interaction with each other in free societies. If an imperative is to be drawn from this, it is twofold. To keep alive various humanistic centers for the interpretation of the values of life together with the scientific centers that explore its facts and to maintain the avenues of interaction between them and other centers of power such as business and the state, so that policy and the exercise of power are affected by this kind of interaction. Third, the nature of man as a moral being is such that while he is able to be nasty, mean, brutish, and small, to quote from Hobbes, he also inclines away from the evil and toward the good to follow St. Thomas. The evil and the good are terribly vague terms in such a statement, but can minimally be given content sufficient for our purposes here. At least inclination away from the evil can be transposed into abhorrence at the destruction of what seems to make human life worth living. Historically, for example, we have seen the persistence of men's chafing under conditions which drastically limit their freedom to choose, to act, to experiment, to believe. We have seen resuscitation again and again of a human longing for a better life, free from needless suffering, searching for order and peace, enlarging the range of human choice. To be sure, contrary tendencies have emerged persistently enough to prohibit a bland optimism or a blind utopianism. 
but countervailing tendencies to these also persist, to become, become correctives to what many men would be consideration, to consider to be aberrations from what it means to be human. Perhaps under possible totalitarian cons conditions, research on the brain could be used to implement the domination of man's destructive tendency. But on the basis of man's deep longing for life, for peace, for goodness, we can have some confidence that such a possibility will be limited. Fourth, Christians and Jews particularly have certain convictions about God, the source and, and giver of the power of life itself, that ought to bring confidence tempered by a realistic assessment of potential misuses of knowledge and power. There is, to quote again from Father Robert Johan, a bearing or import of belief in God upon the qualities of our lives. That import or bearing is dependent upon the nature and content of those beliefs, as well as our appropriation of their significance for dispositions and attitudes toward human development. Christian doctrine and its significance for our bearing toward life cannot be more than pointed toward here. But it is at least this, that God is worthy of our confidence and that the God who is worthy of our confidence is the one who is given and continues to give life its development and its order, the one who makes possible the restoration of brokenness in the human community, the one who makes possible the restraints of man's moral evil, as well as the newness of life and knowledge that he enjoys, indeed the God who is himself love and power, goodness and life. The significance for our lives of such beliefs, of trusting in God whom Christians confessionally know in Jesus of Nazareth, ought to be and can be, and often is, one of confidence without either despair or illusion as we face the human uses of new scientific knowledge. Men are prone to extremes of disposition all too often. They flutter like birds between despair and illusion. They fear a world that will destroy all that they value, or they dream of a world that will realize all that they cherish. They forget that they participate in creativity, and this makes possible both new good and new evil. Despair results from the absence of confidence and hope. It is resignation to fatedness, as if things will inexorably be what they will be, without human initiative, interaction, and activity. Confidence and hope come from a sense of the possible, from those certainties of experience and belief that enable men to participate as creative interactors with the processes of life itself, knowing that mistakes will be made, but also that many of them can be corrected. Now on to requisites for personal or humane existence. What seem to be the functional requisites for human life, in the sense not only of biological preservation and development, but in the sense of personal meaningfulness? We can begin this exploration by looking at lists of such requirements that have been made by others. Bronislaw Malinowski was one of the creative analysts of human culture who stipulated several lists of such requisites. On one occasion, he listed seven basic needs of man, each of which is the basis for a cultural response and institutionalization. Metabolism requires what he calls a commissariat. Reproduction requires a kinship system. Bodily comfort requires shelter. Safety requires protective institutions. Movement requires the organization of activity. Growth requires training. Health requires hygiene. The Princeton sociologist, Marion J. Levy, raises the question with reference to the needs for a human society to exist and lists 10 requisites adequate physiological relationships for biological survival, differentiation and assignment of social roles, communication, a shared cognitive orientation or way of knowing, a shared articulated set of goals, some regulation of the choice of means, a regulation of emotional expression, adequate procedures for education or socialization, effective control of disruptive behavior, and adequate institutionalization. Such lists are subject to refinement, elaboration, and revision, but for our purposes can be accepted as pointing to minimal conditions necessary for minimal continuity of human life. 
they do not without extension or revision account for many of the things that we as human persons find to be most valuable and rewarding in life. Just as the question, what makes the brain's function, is not the same question as, what does it mean to be a person? So the question, what conditions are necessary for the basic survival of man, is not the same question as, what makes life worth living? If some of the things that make life, life worth living can be indicated, we are on the way to understanding what values ought to be preserved, sustained, sought, and developed in the uses of neurobiological research. I shall not attempt a full delineation of all the things that man strive for and live for. Rather, I shall isolate only a few of them that seem to be crucial to the enhancement of the human spirit, to use a term that has no precise neurobiological references. The first is freedom, which has been alluded to as an aspiration that is persistent enough in men to give us some confidence that men will resist uses of knowledge that destroy it and promote uses that enhance it. The preservation and development of human liberty within the bounds necessary for order, which itself sustains liberty, comes to the fore again and again in moral responses to political developments, religious developments, and scientific developments. We see it in anti-colonialism. We see it in the reform of the Catholic Church. We see it in the concerns that men have about the uses of human beings for scientific experimentation. Edward Schills, a Chicago sociologist, for example, in a passionate critique of some of the research of his fellow social scientists, raises three ethical issues that arise from experimentation itself, not to mention the uses of knowledge derived from it. Each of the three, but primarily the first, has ultimate reference to liberty, to freedom. They are, first, the propriety of the manipulation of adult, human, normal human beings, even for their own good, by other human beings. Second, the propriety of possible injury to a human being on behalf of scientific progress and the progress of human well-being. And third, the depth and permanence of the effects of experiment on the individual subject. Absolutized in the abstract, such concerns would seem to falsify many other concerns we, are, we believe are worthy in life. Human beings are influenced, if not manipulated, by other human beings all their lives. Indeed, culture would not persist if this were not so. The liberties and rights of some men are over and over again limited for the sake of others. As, for example, the limitation of the liberty of a landlord to designate to whom he will rent an apartment that is involved in the progress of civil rights in this country. But Schills is pointing to some almost primitive moral sensitivities that crop, crop up wherever personal liberty is threatened. Men resent being manipulated. There seems to be a betrayal of trust and confidence in it, a diminution of one's control over his own responses. Human life seems to be worth living, only if the value of personal freedom is attended to, though obviously other values of equal or almost equal importance are not always in perfect harmony with it. Another requisite that needs to be met in order to make life worth living is trust. As such perceptive thinkers as Gabriel Marcel and Josiah Royce have shown, men live to a considerable extent by reliance upon the trustworthiness of others and must themselves be trustworthy in order to live at all, which is to live in community with others. Trust becomes important only when we have developed the human brain that enables personal liberty to be meaningful and the personal relationships and personal relationships to be determined not simply by biological interactions and necessities, but by responses and commitments consciously made. To be sure, some analogies might be drawn between the reliance of chemical agents on the functioning of each other in the workings of the brain on the one hand, and the reliance of persons on each other for the sustenance and meaningfulness of life on the other. But trust as something valued in personal interrelations or in the relations between groups and even nation states can be withdrawn, betrayed, broken by willful acts of men. Trust, like the assurance of a significant domain of personal liberty, is a moral requisite for human life. It involves honesty, compliance with promises and commitments, 
conformity to rules and procedures of life that set the boundaries and directions within which human interaction occurs, as well as personal confidence that others will sustain rather than betray the self. Uses of knowledge that make life and other persons untrustworthy will denigrate personal existence. Uses that enhance the phenomenon and value of trust will sustain and develop. Personal existence in human community depends upon relationships of love. Love is one of the looser terms in common human discourse. It refers to sexual relations in which there is an affection of persons for each other. It refers to utter self-sacrifice as symbolized by the cross in this chapel. It refers to the relationships of friendship. It refers to a profound longing for various objects as potential sources of self-fulfillment. As a moral requisite for personal life, however, we may use it in a more, with more restricted references. It involves joyous and thankful response for the existence of others and for life itself, for the relationships between us. It directs a relationship of respect for the autonomy of others, so that in love there is neither a swallowing up of others for the sake of self-aggrandizement nor a blind submissiveness to the others for the sake of loss of self-identity. There is loyalty to others, not for the sake of the utility to the self, but for the very sake of the existence of others as others. There is trustworthiness in love. Fidelity to each other is part of the order of love. The possibility for the fulfillment of relations of love is a requisite for human personal existence. Research that is now being done on the human brain might very well lead to developments which make such relationships more possible rather than less possible at least insofar as such relationships are dependent upon neurobiological functions, men may be able to check some of the basically physical conditions that cripple some persons, that do not enable them to respond freely in loving relationships. Certainly the uses of new knowledge for the sake of human and personal life will have to consider the importance of maintaining and enhancing the possibilities of love as one of its touchstones. Uses that deter such possibilities will have to be guarded against. Many other requisites, in part related to freedom, trust, and love, could be developed, such as hope, justice, order, joy, opportunity for achievement, and many more. I shall limit my consideration to these three, for they illustrate the kinds of moral requisites that are dependent upon biological survival and upon the intricacies of the human brain, but take some flight from this dependence as values or concerns to be attended to in themselves. I would not claim that these values are any more dependent upon religious beliefs about God or upon the cultivation of the religious life than they are upon the neurological structure and function of man. I would, however, indicate that freedom, trust, love, justice, joy, and hope have been nourished by humanistic Christianity and Judaism, and that in the pluralism of the society which is to come, it will be the function of religious communities or their secular alternatives to nourish these needs of man to keep their importance alive in the increasingly technically oriented culture. If fewer and fewer men will appropriate traditional religious beliefs out of doubts of their credibility, they will nonetheless have to recognize the importance of religious life and in providing and cultivating a sense of the numinous, a sense of the qualities of life that make scientific and technical life worth pursuing. While I, no more than any other theologian, would wish to justify religious belief exclusively on the basis of its bearing or import on the quality of life that it can bring into being, I am prepared to assert that renewed religious life, dependent upon certain beliefs, does make a contribution to the humanization by sustaining and fostering moral requisites for personal human life. Like the uses of scientific knowledge, the uses of religion are morally ambiguous. There is no absolute certainty that traditional religion will any more function for humanization, just as there is no certainty that new knowledge of the brain will. The pangs of criticism and renewal, which religious communities are now going through, give some expectation that the recognition that God is for man and for man's well-being will strengthen man's own ability to be for man and for the well-being of other men. Finally, I have a few short statements in terms of directives, some of them moral and social, that it seems to me are worthy of our consideration in talking about the uses of new knowledge about the brain. First, the scientific community has a responsibility to man, to life, 
and if you may permit a theologian to say to God, the giver of life, to be vigilant in its own reflection about potential uses and misuses of knowledge. This vigilance is being exercised, can be exercised in interaction with other people. Second, religious and other communities concerned with human values have a responsibility to scientists and to all men and to God to participate in the interactive processes out of which institutionally and culturally the uses of new knowledge will be determined. This means clearly that humanists, religious people, need at least layman's knowledge of the crucial research and its potentialities. Such a purpose, I believe, is beginning to be fulfilled in conferences like this. Third, all of us have an obligation to keep alive a concern for human values and the culture as a whole through churches, ex educational institutions, mass media of communication, and other agencies. If such work is not done, some of the values themselves might atrophy in the consciences of men. This requires public moral discourse, not for the sake of evoking fear, but for the sake of developing the awareness of man's own worthwhileness in the light of which knowledge can be put to the service of man. I wish to underscore this point. For all too often, our immediate response to new developments that pose threats as well as possibility for good is to think in terms of legal restraints and direction, with the sanctions of the state and political power. To such we will turn. But even legal directives will depend upon, for their efficacy, upon a nebulous but real moral ethos which sustains human values. Fourth, all of us have an obligation to maintain pluralism in and through free societies. Pluralism of activity, sciences, religion, arts. Pluralism in the institutionalization of moral concerns. Pluralism in the concentrations of power. No one group is sufficient to provide answers to existing and potential questions. There is need for, of others for information, insight, restraint, support, and development. Fifth. New institutionalizations are necessary to make possible the significant interaction between groups with particularized interests, interests and knowledge that can give direction to the development of man. Some such seminars and conferences, we participate in one, are coming into being. But all too often the interaction is on a random basis. There are centers for the study of population problems and international policy that bring together the knowledge and ideas and insights of various disciplines that bear upon these problems. The interesting thing is very often humanists, and I don't care here whether they're Christian or any other kind, are not in on these discussions. Further developments of this sort are in order, whether under the auspices of states, universities, churches, business, or various combinations of them. Six, some boards and agencies with technical competence and power are needed to set limits through law and other means to potentially destructive uses of knowledge. We face this on, the issue, on an issue which may, in the long run, be of very limited significance in comparison to the potential uses of knowledge developed in molecular biology, namely the whole business that's in the news these days about electronics and bugging. Ways of protecting human rights to privacy are necessary through law. It is necessary to have power to enforce and protect such a fundamental right. Something comparable may be necessary with reference to some potential uses of molecular biology of the brain. Seventh, the freedom to do research needs to be distinguished sufficiently from the use of research so that man's right to knowledge is preserved. This involves its own risks. New knowledge may enable a development of man into something quite different from what we know in our thin slice of history. Professor Smith made reference to this last night as well. Man is no more a static process, part of the process of creativity and development than our other organisms. The right to know what is involved in human development needs maximum protection. Eighth and finally, much more detailed and clearer formulation of those values to be preserved and developed in human existence needs to be made so that these might function both to indicate the direction that uses of research ought to take in terms of their humanistic implications and the limitations that uses ought to be uh, the limitations that ought to be put on certain uses of knowledge. Biological survival is only the beginning of such a formulation, and its form is itself subject to change. To confine myself to previous remarks in this paper, I would say that usage that uses that preserve and foster liberty, trust, love, justice, joy, hope, all of these things are to be supported. 
those that deprive man of these moral requisites for his existence are to be prohibited. Intensive and continuous dialogue needs to be sustained to solve the much harder questions as to what new uses would have what effect on what values. Amendment of possible legal restrictions will always have to be possible so that prohib prohibitions can be revised in the light of worthy new possibilities. But law and morality have a necessary conservative function as well as enabling function in the preservation of life and what makes it worthwhile. In the great game of life that is being played, we are the players as well as being the cards and the stakes. Thank you. I think we are aware that what we've heard this morning not only deserves but will receive consideration well beyond the confines of this conference and certainly has raised questions and given some answers to points which we will need to consider as citizens as well as as people of learning and believers. It seemed to me particularly significant to have the emphasis placed on the safety that lies in the centers of power and of interest and to some extent in the uh, abrasiveness and irritation which they provide for one another. There is, I suppose, a natural force in our time leading toward centralization and toward conformity and that this is true not least in the political arena where the dynamic seems to be as in all the other areas the dynamic is its own and is not necessarily the product of anyone's intention and where because it tends to be inclusive by the very nature of political institutions, it may suggest that particular hazards lie in this direction. I wonder, Dr. Gustafson, if you might wish to comment while these questions are coming forward to that point. That is to say, there seems to be a natural dynamic in the sciences which leads to a given result and which must be granted its freedom. There are natural dynamics in these other pluralistic aspects of our culture which move in given directions and which do not await the decisions of other people. Is it not distinctive of the political structure that while it also has its own dynamic, it tends to be inclusive in its concerns rather than specific, and that it may therefore be that the effect and the impact of the Christian, of Christian considerations must be directed in a particular way to this larger area which serves both as arbiter and as conciliator between our conflicting centers of power. I want to be most tactful in answering the president's question because one could go off in a certain direction and be misinterpreted as a celebrator of the John Birch Society, I'm afraid, uh, with its absolutization of liberty uh, as sort of the single value uh, to be preserved. Uh, uh, it, it is necessary, obviously, in complex societies for there to be an institution which is, to some extent, the arbiters between other institutions. Uh, and the state, obviously, is the institution that fulfills that function uh, more than any other particular organization. And certainly we've seen the growth of the concentration of power in the state, even in democratic societies, and we've seen the good effects of that. 
namely the possibilities of interposing in areas in which in general free society that the political power, which to considerable extent has to be concentrated in the hands of the government and the state, is itself susceptible to public response. And that's the importance of democratic societies with their elections. It's the importance of, of, of multiple political parties in a society, which keep a certain kind of pluralistic concern for the issues alive so that people continue to be able to make significant choices. It also seems to me that we've got to uh, formulate the ways, or maybe they'll just come into being, in which uh, more immediately there is a kind of communication between people in political power and uh, not experts, I don't trust experts any more than anybody else does, but people who have profound sense of human values. So that it's not only once every four years that we elect a president or every two years we elect a Congress or whatever it may be that we can respond to how political authority and power is being exercised, but that there can be significant communication between something other than uh, uh, Harris polls uh, in, in the formation of, of political life. There's a certain kind of political leader that attracts me in this regard, namely the one that sees himself not only as the responder to a consensus that emerges out of polls or something else, but the political leader who's, who engages himself in the interaction that formulates the, the, the moral culture which is so important in the preservation and extension of liberties. Uh, well, I'll proceed. I'll depend on the president to tell me when to stop here. Did you have these in any order, sir? Carol. Does your, uh, your sort of, pardon the expression, use of the name of God <laughs> indicate your unsureness of how this term communicates in this day, or rather unsureness of what you yourself mean by the term? Uh, it's primarily the former uh, and uh, not the latter. I have some convictions about its meaningfulness and about its limitations as a term and what it can refer to and cannot refer to. I just think when we're involved in interdisciplinary conversation that there's no point in putting up red flags. Now, I think the things I said about God this morning in terms of God as, uh, as sort of the guarantor of the goodness of life and so forth, I could have secularized and left God's name out and talked about the fact that all of us appreciate the goodness of life. We respond to a goodness of life which is given to us by gratitude. Now, I don't want to say God is life. You know, God equals life or life equals God. But nonetheless, the goodness of life is dependent in my theological reflection upon a power and goodness which is embedded in it, perhaps also other than it, which supports and sustains it. So it's partly a matter of communication under interdisciplinary situation. Can you possibly once again give your statement on pluralism in our society and what could be causing these tensions between different cultures in the society? Uh, it says they want the quote. I don't know whether I can find it, frankly, in a, in a minute or two. I could reiterate the concern. Perhaps it's not necessary since the president has already reiterated that concern. Uh, I, I think the desire and the dream of harmony uh, is not only foolish, impossible, uh, but morally stupid. Uh, that if, if there's anything that, any point at which perhaps some analogy between biological development and human moral development can be meaningfully made, it is perhaps between the fact that uh, there are risks, potentialities for development, uncertainties, that various combinations of various forces resisting each other, sustaining each other, informing each other, bring development ongoing. Uh, it's in this interactive process. Now, I just happen to be convinced, you see, that abrasive, uh, abrasiveness between human communities, just as abrasiveness between persons, is terribly important for our development as persons. Every one of us is a teacher, while we don't get up and you know, try to upset students simply for a kind of existential kick. Nonetheless, believe that something is involved in learning, for example, by being abrasive to what the student brings to the subject matter prior to his coming. Now, nothing would be achieved socially or personally apart from tension, abrasiveness between persons and society and communities in the human society. Now, obviously, there has to be some ultimately unifying commitment or some ultimately unifying object of loyalty and trust. We don't even need to specify it. We just live as if there is one. We don't need to specify it. But, uh, but 
tensions are important. Morally, they are important. I just could ramble on all forever here with citations. We're all worried about the stresses and strains that have resulted from the civil rights movement. But it's obvious that the progress made in civil rights could not have been made without tensions. And it may take more rather than less. That's what we're beginning to see now, you see. Now, we could dream of a perfectly harmonious society in which all of our dreams would be fully realized, but it'd be pretty deadly. It'd be like a kind of constant state of euphoria, and I don't think a constant state of euphoria is necessarily productive in any particular way. What is the basis, including origin, of man's moral sense? Did Hitler, Eichmann, and others have a moral sense? Does anyone have an immoral sense? Now, moral sense uh, is a very difficult term. Uh, it, I think we make a mistake if we sort of try to find something in the body which would call the moral sense, although goodness knows, maybe we're going to find uh, those particular clusters which have most impact upon our moral responses. I wouldn't want to call them the moral sense. Uh, I would want to use that term in a particular way, not in the sense that there is something that every man has the same of, uh, no, not in the sense that there's an entity, even not physical, but if we can think of entities in other, in other physical terms, something that everyone has. I would rather talk in terms of uh, moral conscientiousness. I would rather talk in terms of moral sensibilities, moral sensitivities, which it seems to me are, the, are themselves, uh, to some extent, if I, can, if I can use loose language here, uh, a cumulative effect of previous moral experiences that we have. And yet, themselves condition the kinds of moral responses we make to new moral experiences that we have. Now, obviously, in the formation of these moral sensitivities or these predispositions to respond morally in certain ways, there are profoundly uh, culturally determining factors. Now, we all know that, that uh, many of our Jewish friends are terribly sensitive to human suffering, see, much more so than Christians, see. Now, why is that? It's part because memory, not only memory of one's own personal life, but memory of the history of the community of which one is a part, which has been passed on to one. Memory evokes a kind of awareness of the cost of various kinds of suppression, torture, other things, and makes these people, many of them, highly sensitive to human suffering. Now, that's not a moral sense, it seems to me, that it, presently we could transplant from them to others. It's the product of a, a tremendous accumulation of things. Did Hitler, Eichmann have moral sense? Well, you know, if, if the word moral is a descriptive term, yes, they had bad moral sensitivities. Uh, that is to say, they made judgments about what was right and wrong. They'd made judgments about what is good and bad. Now, what is the area of disagreement between us and them? It isn't in the fact that they have a different structure, human structure, than we have that's radically the case. The area of disagreement is in part a, a kind of historical analysis. What kinds of experiences in relation not only to mother and father and other things, but in relation to the communities in which these people grew, gave them the kinds of dispositions and predispositions to seek the ends that they sought to seek uh, and to respond in the ways in which they responded? There's probably considerable difference between my moral autobiography and Hitler's moral autobiography. Considerable difference between those two things. But there are other differences of agreement. They may some that can be relatively objectified. One could have, in part, a rational argument with somebody of this stripe, presumably, if they hadn't been totally caught up in the charisma of the movement, about why you know, certain ends are worthy of seeking. Ultimately, I assume uh, that kind of rational argument uh, would uh, itself break down. Is your Christian humanism a justification, quotes, for the problems and ideas raised by scientific inquiry that seemingly aren't adequately answered by the present church? That is a way to juxtapose Christianity and science. The question is whether I talked, I suppose, about whether I called it Christian humanism uh, as a way of indicating that the church itself presently is, is not adequate to do this. Uh, no, I, I, I don't use that as a kind of an apologetic term on an occasion like this, although my, what somebody observed as tongue-in-cheek use of God seemed to have an apologetic interest. No, I, I think essentially there is no contradiction uh, and certainly a great deal of mutual support between the bearing and import of Christian belief on human life 
and uh, uh, the bearing and import of other beliefs in human life. Uh, I have no apologies whatsoever for calling myself a Christian humanist. Humanism here obviously does not connote uh, a kind of uh, absolute autonomy and power confined only to the man himself. If humanism were used in those terms, that man is his own end, man is his own source of power, I would not consider myself a Christian humanist. I consider myself a Christian humanist in the sense of one who is concerned for humane, personal values and the order of society and life that makes that possible. Uh-oh, is God dead? Uh, That's, I bring out my watch. Uh, that's uh, intrinsically the question is impossible to answer uh, in rational terms. Uh, I think the, the interesting thing here is, you know, what do people mean when they ask the question? I was in a, I have been in meetings with some of the people who uh, are the, uh, ex uh, the sort of newsworthy proponents of uh, this kind of a question. Now, if you ask the question, is God dead, are you asking the question, is it hard to believe in God? Well, I, th I think it is hard to believe in God. I, <laughs> I don't know many serious religious people who don't have their moments of doubt. As one of my distinguished colleagues says, there are days when I could write all I believe in on the head of a pin. And there are other days when I could put it on a three by five card. And then there are those days when it would take me you know, a whole volume to do it. But the, 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 the persistence of kind of radical doubt, I think, for modern man is always present. Now, if you're saying, is God dead, is the question, is it hard to believe in God, I would say, well, other people have found it hard to believe in God. I find it hard to believe in God sometimes. Therefore, at least on that evidence, yes, it's hard to believe in God. Uh, there are other forces which make me trust and believe, you see, which are stronger some days than others as well. Now, if you're asking the question, you know, is God dead? Well, that's really a meaningless question. I mean, if God is God, he's not dead. And if he's dead, he's never been God. And it gets down to that kind of logical problem, you see. That is to say, God, by any acceptable definition, cannot die, you see. Now, so you could alter the meaning of the word God in such a way and make this a meaningful question. But then you so alter the meaning of the word God that you're talking about something different than traditionally the word God is referred to in theological discourse in the Western world, you see. Well, those are very intricate problems. Now, if you say, is it impossible to believe in God? Well, that's obviously not the case because people do. You see? Now, is it impossible to believe in God if there is no God? See? Is it possible to believe in God if there is no God? Well, obviously, we can believe in illusions. And our belief in illusions has some impact on our behavior. And I'm sure the microbiologist can tell us a little bit, or will someday, about what the significance between belief and behavior is and through what mechanisms this takes place in the brain. Oh, you can believe in illusions. And they can have impact on your behavior. Now, uh, I don't think there's any rational way ever of affirming persuasively to all mankind uh, that belief in God is not an illusion. Now, you could, could argue it's for the, as indicated Bob Johan does, for certain qualities of life that are emergent from those beliefs, but you'll notice that in what I quoted from him and everything I said, I talked about things being dependent upon our belief in God, see? And I didn't want to get into this kind of theological argument, whether there's some sufficient grounds for belief in God. Uh, no, I, I think matters of religious belief are more instructively talked about in terms of, uh, of analogies with interpersonal things, you know? Do I believe now, obviously, I can see my wife. I can't see her right now, but uh, you know, when I'm home, I can see my wife. But there's a sense in which my trust in her is dependent on much more than her visibility. And the fact that I trust in her and love her is much more complex matter than anything that neurobiologists or psychologists or all of them put together could say about her. Uh, there's a sense in which she sustains my existence and restrains my existence. 
Uh, uh, there's a sense in which certain ends of life that I have and the proximate order of things are directed by this relationship. And I think some of us find that there is grounds for confidence in a kind of trust most of the time in life and therefore in power, which is the giver of life so that we can believe in God. And in this sense, it is meaningful for us to say God is not dead, which I suppose is the appropriate last remark in a Christian chapel.